Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Gustav Pollock Lecture in the virtual JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. This lecture was established in 1954 in honor of Gustav Pollock, who is an author, critic, scholar, and journalist who immigrated from Vienna to the US in the 1880s. He wrote books on topics such as child rearing, European history, literary criticism, and his classic was 50 Years of American Idealism, the New York Nation from 1865 to 1915. The Pollock Lecture focuses on stimulating interest in government careers with a view to building a better government. Today, we will be exploring the growing role of behavioral science in policymaking. My name is Jackie Lefkowitz and I'm zooming in from Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm a master in public policy candidate at Harvard Kennedy School and co-president of the Behavioral Insights Student Group. Previously, I worked at a nonprofit applying behavioral science to design and test solutions for difficult social problems. Nudge was the first book on my office desk. And I was drawn to the Kennedy School by its strong behavioral science community and came with the goal of building better policies and programs that aligned with human behavior. And as a student, I've seen countless classmates dedicated to serving others discover a passion for behavioral economics just as I had years back. Now I'm truly honored to welcome our guest, Richard Thaler. Richard Thaler is the 2017 recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his incredible contributions to behavioral economics. His studies focus on behavioral economics and finance, as well as the psychology of decision-making, which lies in the gap between economics and psychology. He investigates the implications of relaxing standard economic assumptions and entertaining the possibility that people are sometimes human. Richard Thaler is the Charles R. Walgreen Distinguished Service Professor of Behavioral Science and Economics at the University of Chicago, the co-author of the bestseller Nudge, which he'll discuss in today's talk, as well as Misbehaving, Making of Behavioral Economics. He has published numerous articles in prominent journals and is a member of the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Finance Association and the Econometric Society, and in 2015 served as the president of the American Economic Association. Todd Rogers, a professor of public policy here at Harvard Kennedy School, will moderate today's conversation. Todd is a behavioral scientist whose work supports student success and attendance, strength, strengthens democracy, and improves communication. Todd has co-founded the Analyst Institute, which improves voter communications and everyday labs, which aims to reduce student absenteeism. Here at Harvard, he is also the faculty director of the Behavioral Insights Group, faculty chair of the Executive Education Program, Behavioral Insights and Public Policy, and director of the Student Social Support R&D Lab. I've had the privilege of collaborating with and learning from Todd as a member of his teaching team uh, this past year. And I could not be more excited to welcome both of you to this forum. So thank you again to everyone joining us and a very warm welcome to Richard Thaler and Todd Rogers. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Richard, can you hear me? I can. Okay, I can hear and, you too. And see you. Oh, good. Okay, hi. Uh, Jackie is also the co-president of the Behavioral Insights Student Group, which is the largest student group on Harvard University's campus, uh, which has students from all the different schools as members. And by last count, I think something on the order of 800 to 1,000 student members. Wow. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really a movement on campus, and Jackie has been a leader of it. Um, thanks, thanks for joining us, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure. Always good to talk to you, Todd. What's... <laughs> um, Let's just get started with the uh, the new edition of Nudge, the new the new edition and final edition. Uh, why a softball? Why for those of those of you unfamiliar, it is called Nudge, the final edition. Uh, why is it why is it called the final edition, Richard? Well, uh, as as you know, Todd, I'm um, I'm a fan of commitment strategies. So you know, there's there's now a, a, a well-known story that's probably 40 years old of me taking a big bowl of cashew nuts and hiding it in the kitchen so that my dinner guests wouldn't finish the entire bowl and ruin their appetites. 
And um, rewriting Nudge was a fool's errand. And um, I had to convince Cass to do it. it. It happened because we were bored, or at least I was bored. It, it was last July, if you remember, last July there wasn't a whole lot going on. And so uh, we decided to have a look and see what was in this book, and a lot of it just seemed old. But I knew, after it was done, I knew I never wanted to do this again. So the final edition, I've told Cass if he wants to do it, his co-author will be posthumous. <laughs> okay, so there you go. You let the big secret out, because in the intro, you said only one of us believes that this is, in fact, the final edition. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> what... um. What's what's new in the new edition that or, or importantly, not just what's rewritten, like what 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 had to be added uh, in the last 13 years since the original came out? You know, there, so a lot had to be added, a lot had to be subtracted. So, um, you know, one of the first things I noticed was we were talking about the spiffy iPod. <laughs> Uh, which I'm pretty sure doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we had what we thought was a brilliant chapter solving the problem of making sure people um, could have same-sex marriage. And, um, you know, the world didn't need us for that. It just legalized it. So our clever... So we, the chapter was called Privatizing Marriage. The, the idea was that marriage, the word marriage is loaded. So let's take the legal aspects away from that word. And so the state would only give civil unions or whatever name you wanted to call it, it would be a legal partnership. Um, marriages would be private. Churches, squash clubs, um, bowling alleys, whoever wanted to do a marriage could do it. Anyway, um, we didn't need that chapter anymore. We, um, we did want to have a new chapter on uh, what I call sludge, which is, so, well, we use it in a lot of different ways. It's bad. And of course, literally sludge is the gunk that uh, clogs up various processes and government is full of sludge. So are private organizations. I'll give you, I'll give you an example, a, a recent e example. I was filling out a financial disclosure form for a well-known economics club in Cambridge the name of which I won't name, but it's a 1050 Mass Ave. And so I filled out a three page form of various dis financial disclosures, got to the end of this form and clicked a button that said in all caps, finish. And I closed it and sent the person who had been harassing me to fill out this form, an email saying, okay, I'm done. The next day I get an email, no, you're not. What do you mean? Turns out finish on that form does not mean finish. To finish, you have to go back to the first page and click submit. So I asked her just offhand, um, how many people Am I the only dumb one? And she said, no, about half. And, and it's been this way for 10 years. So <laughs> this is sludge. And, you know, many of the programs that the government has run in the past year trying to help people are full of sludge. And, you know, the... PPP, the programs to uh, help small businesses, 
were really good if you had a great banker and a great lawyer and people who are good at filling out forms like that one. And not so good if you're running a restaurant and the main thing you knew you know is how to cook. And so, so, so we, we, we're, uh, we're on a campaign to get rid of sludge and uh, make things easy. So sludge is, is sludge is, is not just um, like sludge is both in the private sector where it's making it difficult to cancel subscriptions, right. but also all administrative, unnecessary, burdensome administrative costs that are just frictions that effectively make it so that they discourage people from participating. Right. And, and, you know, in the private sector, it's both internal, like those forms and expense reports, and external, like making it hard to unsubscribe. And um, I, I, I'm on a campaign to get companies to make the process of unsubscribing the same as subscribing. And, uh, but I, I've got a lot of work to do. So that's like a, like a symmetry that if you're going to make it super easy to subscribe, it's got to be easy to, to cancel. Yeah. It's unsubscribing shouldn't be like claiming a rebate, right? Re rebates, the redemption rate is about 25%, something like that. And it, it, that's a, a scam and it's a very old one and they, they there are lots of traps you have to cut out the SKU from a piece of cardboard and mail it in and then you'll get back a physical check that you have to remember to go deposit right so um so yeah we there was a gym I heard about that was requiring people during the pandemic to come to the gym in person if they wanted to cancel their membership. This this should should not be. Can I so can I mirror part of this back, which is one of the early uh, like educational applications was. Bridget Terry Long and collaborators have this simplified FAFSA where they pre-populate yep. what was at the time a 10-page document that takes 45 minutes to complete. And it, 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 it makes you eligible for Pell Grants and, and Stafford loans and other kinds of educational benefits. But it's a precondition for getting any of those public benefits. And parents have to fill it out senior year sometime in January. And they by pre-populating it for middle and low-income families, they made it so that one in 12 low-income kids who would not have gone to college otherwise went to and through college. So like that, that, that happened to be a really high leverage point of friction. Would that would, that would be, would that be, would that that's, be sludge? It was, yeah, that's re removing sludge. You know, there's this great experiment that Susan Donarski ran who, recently joined Harvard from Michigan. And when she was at Michigan, they ran a, a big experiment where they wrote letters to kids from low-income school districts who had good grades and said, if you apply and are admitted to the University of Michigan, we're promising you a full scholarship. You won't have to fill out any forms and it's guaranteed. And that greatly increased the number of kids that applied. So, and you know, I spent the better part of this weekend preparing the information for my accountant to do my taxes. I don't, you know, we're, we're not talking about filling out the forms, just getting all the right pieces of paper and downloading the forms and so forth and so on. In Sweden, almost everybody files their tax return 
by text message. They get a text from the government that says, you, we owe you $1,100, do you want it? Yes, click, and the money appears in your bank account. Now, we could do that in this country for 90% of taxpayers. Because one of the parts, one of the better parts of the Trump tax reform was they increased the standard deduction. So something like 90% of taxpayers don't itemize which means the government could send you a completed, a pre-populated 1040. They know how much money you've made. They know how much interest you've earned from, you know, the, those various forms I was downloading. They've got all that stuff. Hmm. Send me the tax return. So admittedly, it wouldn't work for me, uh, but it would work for 90%. Uh, Austin Goolsby, one of my colleagues who um, was uh, served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, for some of the Obama administration, had a proposal to do this, and it was blocked by H&R Block and Intuit that owns TurboTax. And they actually got a law passed making it illegal for the IRS to give people free tax returns. Huh. The, the goal, the goal democracy, of that, democracy at work. The goal of that too, as you, you may remember the TurboTax's ad campaign is we're tax people and we wanna make it simple for you. Yeah. Um, they do, the, in return, they do, offer a free tax return for people who ha have one of those simple returns, but good luck getting them to offer you that. And then they'll say, oh, but if you want, it, you, you want us to do your state return as well? Mm. And then would you like a, a reef, tax refund loan? And yeah, so that's all sludge that we would like to get rid of. So I just squaring it with like the standard economics, the standard economics would make sense of what's wrong with sludge because it's just additional cost. It's the right. time, co the opportunity and time cost. And then help me like part of a behavioral economic implication is that sometimes whether it's a free admission to high school, to college, or pre-populating form, it has massively out simplifying things have massively outsized effects that are hard to account for. It's just time cost. Exactly. Right? Yeah, I, you, you know, there was nothing particularly hard about the stuff I was doing this weekend, but you, you know, it's cumbersome. If, if that old uh, retirement plan that I had when I was working somewhere else that I only look at once a year to print the tax return. What was the password? For, you know, it's that's that sort of stuff has an outsized effect because because it's annoying and it's one reason we procrastinate. You know, the, 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 a funny thing, and this is all behavioral economics, is squaring the following two facts. Three quarters of taxpayers get a refund. On average, $3,000. And there's a big line outside the post office the day that the tax returns are due. Ask your favorite economist who believes in rational economic people to uh, explain how those two things can be true. For the uninitiated in the audience, so the, those are, well, I'm, I feel like I'm being tested now because I'm gonna screw up the, the explanation for why those violate rationality. But the way, procrastinating until the 15th, knowing that there's gonna be a line when you could have done on the 14th with no line, is a sort of inefficient use of time. That well, and, time. and why were you waiting till the 14th if they're giving you all this money? 
You could have done it uh, February 1st. Right. All the forms are required to get to you by the end of January. So what were you doing in February and March and April? Now, look, I'm somebody who knows that the actual tax deadline is October 15th because there's an automatic extension. What I was doing Sunday was giving my accountant enough information to file for the extension. <laughs> so I believe in procrastinating. Never, you know, let's be clear about that. As someone who's read a, uh, everything I can get my hands on that you've written, you declare that everywhere. <laughs> that you are a procrastinator. Um, okay, so if you if you could scale any policy or intervention right now, uh, what what would it be? What what are what are you thinking about? Well, you know, here, here's one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently: is it, the government has passed all kinds of laws trying to help people, and they have a lot of trouble sending money to the people who need it the most. And the reason is those people don't have bank accounts and or don't file a tax return. So if you wanna get a check from the government automatically, if you have filed a tax return and have given them a bank account to send the refund to, then those, well, there's no check in the mail, right? Um, it, it, the money just appears in your account. If you're retired, well, if you're retired and getting social security, they probably have your banking information. But if you're just poor and you don't make enough to be required to file a tax return, they don't know who you are. They don't know where you are. And I, I think there should be, um, it should be a right in this country to have a free minimal bank account. So if, if I could snap my fingers, I would have a law that says, walk into any bank, give them your social security number, and they will give you an account with a debit card and no fees and no overdraft. So they can't make any money off of you. But- And, and it doesn't look like that now. It, 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 I don't know what it looks like now. I mean, there'll be some minimum balance. And if you go below the minimum balance, then there are fees. And as a courtesy, they will offer you uh, overdraft. And every, and then every time you go over, it's 25 bucks. And so most civilized countries have such things. And even so <coughs> India is in the midst of rolling something like this out via cell phone. And cell phone penetrate, you don't need a smartphone. If you can get a text message, that's all the technology you need. So there's just no, ex you know, th there's no excuse for not doing this, but there are powerful lobbies that uh, prevent it from happening. What, what is the scale of, of the unbanked for, or, or at least the, some fraction of people experiencing homelessness or, or, or whatever? Because we've know, talked about this. It depends on the program, but I think we may be talking about something like 5% of the population. And it could be a significant portion of the people that we're most concerned with getting to. Got it. And then from there, every that would just make all sorts of other policies easier to like. Yeah, uh, you know, they're talking about this child credit. And I think certainly there, there are people in the uh, Democratic Party that would like to make that permanent as something like that is in most countries. But again, if, if you don't have this, you need a financial address. You know what it's like 
is remember at some point they gave you cell phone number portability. And the cell phone providers fought that because it was a lock-in. If you wanted to switch from Verizon to AT&T, you'd have to change your phone number. So this was a great law. I don't know what administration this passed under, but this is pro-competitive, says you own your number. So what I would like is everybody to have an equivalent of a financial address that um, they could send money to and hopefully the, the debtors, uh, people you owe money to wouldn't be able to rate it. Great. It's almost like the friction of switching bank providers, even if you have a, a, a relatively low cost, one of these accounts uh, is itself an, an like intentionally designed sludge that, yes. that was part of you, the regulation that, that, it, that senior advisor Thaler to the president would have in enforcing this regulation. Well, in, in the UK, we did get a law passed that makes, um, makes it easier for you to switch banks because they have to allow you to export all your prepaid. Mm. So that's exactly the equivalent of taking your phone number with you. Yeah. So if you uh, can take all of that stuff and, you know, again, this is small, it would probably take an hour to update all that stuff on the new bank. But if it's one click, that will make you much more likely to walk away from that bank that was mistreating you. You know, I, just as you're saying that, I'm thinking that one of the one of the things I always wonder about is how you can find what 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 are the attributes of a of a moment or uh, that make it high leverage for an intervention. Like where what and and. So filling out the pre-populating the FAFSA apparently is a high leverage one. Yeah. Admitting a high school, but not every moment is high leverage. And I'm sort of thinking that that in addition to it being time intensive, such that procrastinators would avoid it, but there's also there's all it also is overly procrastinated if you feel like insecure or not confident in knowing that you're doing it right. Or so I don't, what how would you think about how do you find well, good Moment. Yeah, look, all the reforms we've managed to get through in 401k plans are of this sort, right? Automatic enrollment, automatic escalation or save more tomorrow, good default investment funds. Um, people find the idea of managing a portfolio very daunting, reasonably so. And, it, you know, you don't have to be rich for your retirement account to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the idea that we ask people to figure that out. And then the, the part that we haven't done nearly enough on, one of the things I like thinking about is at, for people my age. So what do we do? Let's say you've been a good saver, you hit whatever age you're gonna retire, you have a million dollars saved up in your 401k plan, company gives you a gold ring or a watch or whatever they do, say bye Todd, and uh, here's your money. And now uh, what? And drawing the money down is a way harder problem than building it up because there's a lot more uncertainty. You, you think about, I, I don't know how old you are, Todd, but let's say you're planning to retire in 25 years. And so that's a, that's a concrete goal. And one you could adjust. If, you, if you're planning to retire at 70 and you, it's you're 65 and you're like, gee, I really haven't been doing enough. Maybe I'll push it back a little. Or I've been doing better than I thought. Maybe I'll quit a little earlier. When you flip it around, 
you, you start retirement, say at 65, you have a life expectancy maybe of 20 years. If you have a, if you're a guy with a younger wife and women long, live longer, your spouse could easily have a life expectancy of 30 years, but there's lots of variation around it. It's just a really hard problem. And uh, we, we need turnkey solutions to that, like we've done for the uh, pre-retirement part, so. That's, a, that's another, another good one to work on. I'm gonna move this to another area. Uh, what are what are some behavioral science uh, applications or research that's been useful for diversity and inclusion, or, or how how do you see behavioral science being useful in that space? Well, I, let me say it's a hard problem, um, and the one I think so uh, an obvious thing that people have done in some domains. There's the famous paper by uh, Claudia Golden, who's an old friend of mine, uh, showing that in symphony orchestras, when they started having auditions behind a screen, all of a sudden the number of women went up. Um, now, we, we haven't done that pretty much anywhere else. And it's, there, there will be PhD theses done on what hiring via Zoom has been like. But um, one thing that uh, the so-called blind interviewing for the violin, if we did that for other jobs, one of the things it would do is it would reduce discrimination against people who are not as handsome as Brad Pitt, like you and me, for example. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. Sorry. But provisionally, let's humor that for now. Continue. Yeah, okay, all right. So, um, you know, good looking people get a lot um, in this world, not just in Hollywood. And, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be looking at anybody we were hiring. And not just because it would solve uh, gender differences and racial differences, um, but uh, attractiveness differences. But uh, one of your colleagues, Iris Bonet, has a, a very uh, thoughtful uh, idea, which is when possible, we should be hiring in groups, like say 10 at a time. And the reason is if we're hiring one at a time, then each time it just seems like the white male is the most qualified. And we don't, I mean, look, we looked at all these other candidates and it just so happened that the white male was the most qualified. Now, and if we do that 10 times over the course of a year, none of that will feel wrong. But if you are hiring 10 at once, they're all 10 white guys, then hmm, that's gonna put it right in your face a little bit. So it's like a jury, you know, if, if it's an all white jury, that, that in this day and age now will, stand out. So again, I think there are situations, it's, it's administratively hard to do in many settings. So like hiring faculty, you know, your group may get one slot every third year, right? So it's not like you're hiring 10 faculty at once. So the Situations in which we can do it are limited, but in the situations where we can, then uh, that's a useful idea. Great. You know, I, I should say that I know that since Iris Bonnet is actually uh, the academic dean now at the Kennedy School, 
uh, that Doug and Iris and the team have been trying to make cluster hiring a thing. Yeah, it's well, just what what a surprise. <laughs> uh, you're trying to bring that to work. I, I, I'm getting texts that we have a few, we have a couple more questions before we take students. There's something we've never, you and I, I've never asked you about and we've never talked about, but that uh, I have a hard time believing that it is as, that it, how successful the strategy was as it's told in retrospect. This New Hampshire summer school that you guys did in the 90s, I've read, I, I've read about it, like, can you, would you mind telling us, just because I think that there's a lot of people talking about, uh, not about academic fields, just even about like movement building. Um, and the logic that, if, as I understand it, how you, how you lay that out, and then I'm curious about whether it played out the well, way you thought, the way, the way, how it's played out. So at one point, you know, the Russell Sage Foundation has been very generous to behavioral economics. And at one point, Eric Warner, who was the president there for many years, said, all right, he did something very original. He said, I'm gonna give you some money. It wasn't a huge amount of money, maybe $100,000 a year. That order of magnitude, but this is 30 years ago. And uh, use it in whatever way will help the field most. And at this point, at this point, this is a, like a, the field, which is this nation the thing. The field was Danny and me and Colin Cap. So um, George Lowens, you know, there was like 10 people. So we decided to have uh, a summer school, a summer camp, we always called it. The, for the first ones were in Berkeley. <coughs> um, that, uh, view outside my window. Um, and we just invited graduate students from, uh, at that point it was just US, it became global, and to come for two weeks and learn about this new thing. And uh, it's been going on, I think the first one was in 96, maybe something like that. Um, Two of the students that year were David Labson and Matthew Rabin, who have been running this camp for the last decade or so. So, it, and if you uh, make a list of the who's who of behavioral economics, two thirds of them are graduates of that camp. So, you know, I always say that I don't think that I've ever changed anybody's mind about behavioral economics. So uh, you, you can't, you know, old dogs and new tricks, old economists and new tricks. So I haven't converted anybody, but I've corrupted a lot of young people like you. And uh, that's been a much, you know, you, you, uh, unleash David Lapson and Sendel Mullenath and, and Iris and uh, well, you know, the list goes on. Um, they go out and do stuff. It's like a generational replacement strategy where of like just go and, and, and when doctoral students are still sort of uh, stem cells in their research interests. Our, but, our target was People who had just finished their second year of grad school. Got it. But but the thing, there's a piece of it that I that I repeat to other people that I'm not sure that I want to make sure I want to get from you. You 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 explicitly hoped there would not be a field of behavioral economics, and instead it would infuse all of economics. Is well, that is that right? <clears throat> um, the way I would put it is that I didn't want to start a new kind of economics. Uh, as a separate discipline. And various people had tried that, and that would have been a complete flop. And for years, I fought having a journal because I said, no, we have to, it's going to be really painful, but we have to fight to get our papers in the American Economic Review and the 
QJE and the JPE and same in all the finance journals. Every finance paper I wrote went to the Journal of Finance. And uh, because those are the people, if, if they don't buy in, you're not getting anywhere. And um, so there are journals now, uh, and I'm fine with it, but um, I, I would still encourage my graduate students. Well, I always tell people, don't define yourself as a behavioral economist. Define yourself as a behavioral labor economist or a behavioral financial economist or political economist. And no, a bit of advice that from me that often gets repeated is be about the world, not about the literature. I think graduate students spend way too much time reading journal articles and not enough time thinking. And if you, have, if you feel like you have to read 50 papers on some topic before you go write a paper, I've never written a paper on a topic that there were 50 papers. Why bother? I want to write the 51st paper. It, it has this feel a little of um, that, that Amos Tversky quote of uh, many people waste years because they can't waste hours. Uh, yeah, yeah. Amos, you know, if you look at the work Kahneman Tversky did in the 70s, which made us possible, um, it's like 10 papers. You know, I don't, th you take their resume from the 70s that got them a Nobel Prize, wouldn't get tenure in a lot of psychology departments now. They, they would want 10 papers from grad school. People write too many damn papers. And Amos, like, he would, he was full of scorn for people who were writing too many papers. He would have allowed that guy publishes his wastebasket. And he, so uh, Amos, did, <laughs> Amos did not publish his wastebasket. All right. So I see that at least Doug Elmendorf is, is on the, uh, is on the, viewing this. So as my productivity declines, Doug, I am following Richard's counsel and, uh, and, pub and trying to publish intentionally. One good paper a year. <laughs> Try, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, okay, um, we're going to take a student question. Uh, Lap, please. Uh, yes, great. Yes. Hi, um, thank you so much for joining oh, oh, wait, 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 I'm oh. sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I lost, I almost lost my chance at all these IOP things. It starts with, please say your name, please introduce yourself and realize and ask one question. And remember that, at, uh, I hope I get this right, at, at, at Harvard, questions end in question marks. There, all right. Go you ahead, know, Lab. that's true elsewhere, Todd. Oh, I, I don't know, I just, we just, uh, it's a Harvard thing, I thought. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, you, you guys think that about a lot of things. Anyway, uh, go for yeah. it. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Lap. I'm a, I'm a first year student here at the college. Um, and I'm thinking of concentrating in economics, actually. So, um, yeah. So you mentioned that government programs tend to have a lot of, you know, sludge and baggage that doesn't allow for effective kind of distribution of the funds to needed people. Um, so I'm curious as to um, your stance on the idea of like a universal basic income being kind of a more simplified way of getting aid to people, but uh, with um, by cutting back some of that sludge. Do you are you a proponent or an opponent of the universal basic income idea? Um, I, so you know what's true about everything like this is the devils in the details, but uh, you know who was the original supporter of that idea. And that's Milton Friedman. 
Um, so it, it has, a, a, there's a strong logic to it. And it's really the flip side of, I mean, I would, if my ideal tax plan would look a lot like Ronald Reagan's. I have a column I wrote 10 years ago called the 28% solution. And it was to tax everything at 28%, income, capital gains, um, just make it simple. And um, we can do the same thing um, at the bottom. The, the, the big problem we have is we try to target. And as soon as you start to target, then you start to add complexity. So, you know, people will say, oh yeah, we're all for getting rid of deductions, but we have to have the charitable deduction. And then we have to have the mortgage deduction. And then, you know, then the, you pretty soon you're gonna to get to carried interest, which uh, nobody who isn't a venture capital manager thinks is a good idea. Thank you. So, so Richard, it, 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 taking on laps question. So is there a, given that there are all these pilots and these state city pilots of this, this are there, are there obvious uh, problems or challenges that, that people should be wary of? With you well, you know, the thing is, it's going to be layered on top of the mess. So, and it's not likely to be as generous. And, you know, if, uh, if Berkeley announces uh, a universal basic income and everybody from San Francisco moves to Berkeley, that's not going to work out that well. So ideally, this should be done at the national level. And that's not to say that cities shouldn't do it, but it's, it's going to be harder. Uh, this is, it's the same with, uh, with climate change. I'm all for cities being aggressive, but uh, as you know, in, in the final edition, we come out very strong for a carbon tax. And we say, we're not gonna solve climate change with nudges. Gotta get the prices right, step one. Great. Uh, I'm gonna take another question from a student, Marco Carrasco. Name, the great program, and one question to answer the question mark. Hey, thank you. Uh, well, my name is Marco Carrasco from Peru. I am a second year MPAD student at HKS and I also a professional development co-chair at the Harvard Behavioral Insights Student Group. Uh, thank you for joining today, Professor Teller. Uh, my question is, uh, well, it's basically, we'd like to know your opinion and your uh, thoughts about the uh, Chinese social credit system and regarding its implication to nudges and also sludges in the coming future. Thank you. So uh, I'm, I missed one phrase, what, what part of the Chinese some China something and then yeah and the Chinese social credit systems. So I don't know anything about it. Oh, it's basically basically uh, this technology that uh, allow you know people to rate certain degree of behavior in order to push some kind of uh, uh, behavior that has a lot of criticism regarding the privacy concerns. So, so I, I'm I'm just not informed. So. Um, so I'll do what my students always do when they don't know the answer to a question is I'll answer a different question. Uh, and which is, I just simply don't understand how anyone can object to the idea of a COVID passport. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, an elect, so I happen to have, so I won't lose it, my vaccination card, which if you haven't been vaccinated yet, this is really modern technology. It's a piece of cardboard 
that's too big to fit in your wallet. And it's been filled out carefully with handwriting. That's where we are in the 22nd. I mean, so civilized countries are creating technology so that you'll be able to show an airline or a stadium or your university that you've been vaccinated. And there are people who think this is an invasion of privacy and I don't even get the argument. You have to have a driver's license. You have to have an ID to get on an airplane. Uh, come on, this, this thing could be forged instantly. Um, we're gonna have to do it, but uh, the objections to that and the, the word privacy gets floated around. There's no reason. Um, this, people say they're worried about privacy and they have a cell phone that they carry with them all the time. And people know where you are. There's a, uh, I don't know, Todd, whether you've seen this result that Keith Chen had that with, um, cell phone tracking data, they were able to tell that Thanksgiving dinners that combined red state and blue state families lasted 45 minutes less. <laughs> in, in 2017, right? Like right after the election. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> so, you know, they know where you are. Give me a break. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get, and of course, um, saying if uh, the Red Sox say you got to show the passport to get into Fenway, that's a nudge to get vaccinated. We, the, we have to give some incentives to the people who are uh, refusing to get vaccinated. I, I'm fine with uh, telling them it's not mandatory, but I think I don't know whether Harvard has announced a policy on this, but um, I think universities should all be saying, if you want to come back and live in the dorms, you got to show us your vaccine. Uh, it's an externality. So, uh, okay. So, sorry, couldn't answer your question, but I hope that will do. I, I, I like that. The, uh, Thank you, anyway. <laughs> The way the way politicians get away with it is they don't acknowledge the answer to a different question. Right. Richard, your your uh, your honesty undermined your ability to sneak it in and answer a different question. Uh, <laughs> um, we've one, I'll take one more student question and then and then uh, hard to believe and then and then I'll ask one last one and we'll wrap up. Chen Yu, um, Wang, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Rogers, and thanks for the um, great talk so far, uh, Professor Taylor. So I'm Chen Yi and I'm a visiting undergrad student at Harvard. Um, my home institution is UC Berkeley. Heard you mention Berkeley a couple of times, so remind me about my home institution. Um, I guess my question is that, like I've read your work in a lot of my classes about nudges. I'm just wondering like some components of nudges, like incentives and like defaults, they work like a short term, like for only specific occasions when you apply them. I'm wondering, do you think there's like potential to make this short term effect into like long term, maybe in a way that shape people's mindset? Maybe at some point, um, they're like automatically nudged in a way that do not need much of the intervention in the process, maybe like through education or any other um, ways. Just wondering if you have any thought on this. So let me answer it two ways. One is some nudges do last pretty much forever. And that's because th they're applied in a situation that people don't revisit. So if we can get people automatically enrolled in the retirement plan with their contribution rates going up and in a target date fund, that constantly rebalances their portfolio in a sensible way, that'll last for 40 years. 
And one of the chapters we updated in the new version of Nudge um, was a study I did in Sweden with um, a partially privatized social security system. And we look at 20 years later and there's a huge amount of stickiness. So um, we say that in Sweden, at least nudges last forever, just like diamonds. So no need for that ring guys, just nudge. Thank you, so, Professor. Um, I am getting, I, I'm getting one last, could we add one? Okay, we'll take one more student question and then I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna wrap up and, and I'll, 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 I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna let Noah ask this question and, and uh, Richard, in a di if you can weave in or decide to treat it as a second question, just so that you can have the last word. Um, I'm interested in what you think is the most exciting thing moving forward. Like what, what you're excited to see behavioral science and behavioral economics move towards. And Noah, ask your question and Richard, you can navigate as, as, you, as you artfully choose to. Please, Noah. Cass. Great, thank, thank you so much. Uh, my name's Noah, I'm from Northampton, Massachusetts. I'm actually an incoming first year at the college. Um, so my question is specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, around your discussion of banking, uh, a universal banking address and kind of solving or addressing the issue of the unbanked. Uh, there's a proposal coming from a lot of progressive organizations now that I'm really interested in, which addresses the same issue in a slightly different way by uh, essentially reinstating the 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 prior status quo around postal banking and providing essential financial services through post offices uh, to all Americans who want it. So I'm just curious what your thinking is around that solution versus the solution you mentioned, whether they might be integrated and then whether there might be kind of behavioral issues that behavioral reasons that one might be preferred to the other. So, um, so I, I, yeah, I think that the, the postal banking idea, I, I don't get it. I, I don't, my experience in going to the post office, which I don't have to do very often, but I never look forward to a trip to the post office. Um, <clears throat> we have an entire industry that um, has ATM machines all around the world. I don't think we have to have the government run that. So, um, you know, this is similar to the debates we have about healthcare. I think it's important in that domain that we have universal healthcare. I'm not religious about the best way of providing that. Every system has its drawbacks. So in the UK, it's just the NHS. In Canada, it's provincial, but there are private aspects. Switzerland has a completely different system. Uh, the US clearly has the most expensive. So we pay twice as much as everybody else and get mediocre results. So we can't be doing it right, but what we should replace it with Sure, clearly should have less sludge, but I don't think we want the ho all the hospitals to be like the VA, uh, which is a government run health facility and it's highly variable. So, uh, so I, you know, uh, I'm not gonna be on AOC's uh, Christmas list, but uh, I, I, I don't, necessarily see why uh, the post office would be good at this. Um, those, all those piles of paper I was working on for my accountant, I FedExed uh, this morning. So, um, uh, Todd, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I think I'm just not gonna answer your question. And, uh, and the, the reason is that it's like, I, I never have told a graduate student what they should work on for their thesis. 
I, I don't, I don't give um, problems to people and say, go solve that. I say, come and bring me four ideas and we'll try and find half a good one in the pile. And um, so, um, you know, I've talked about a lot of the things that I find interesting. Um, and I think technology is going to solve a lot of problems and is capable. I mean, one of the reasons I'm so up in arms about this stupid vaccine card is, I mean, why are we using the same technology that our, my grandparents did to show that they got their vaccine? That's ridiculous. So uh, we have technology, uh, let's use it. And as you know, that's a theme that runs through the final edition. We talk about smart disclosure. What, I was an advisor to the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau for the first two years of its existence. They had spent years devising a form that all mortgages would have to have completed with certain numbers and certain boxes. And I said, you know, I don't really care about that. Just make the form machine readable. So that's, I, I, that'll be my answer. And, and it's a nice way of pulling it back. Also, Nudge, the final edition, uh, is is coming out. I don't know. When is it coming out? August 3rd. August 3rd. And it, uh, it, it builds on and actually adds a bunch of really interesting new chapters that I think, uh, that I think is much, we're all much better for. Um, I, I, I think, uh, we, we are now four minutes over. Uh, and so it, it's, it's an incredible privilege to get to spend this hour with you, Richard. Thank you for, uh, for talking with me and with the rest of us and, and for all the work you've done advancing behavioral science. It's, as I said, it's incredibly popular here at Harvard and it's popular in, I think largely inspired by nudge coming out in 2008. And, and we never once said libertarian paternalism in this entire, in this entire time. Now we did. Oh, no one misses it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, okay, are you Todd, closing us out? Thank you. And, Thanks to everybody and uh, nudge for good. Well, thank you, Todd. And thank you, Professor Thaler. You honor us with your presence here at the Gustav Pollock Lecture. And this was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Todd, for moderating it so well. Great student questions. And we all leave with a perspective on behavioral economics and finance and the psychology of decision making. So thank you most sincerely. I just wanted to tell our audience about two forums this week as we wrap up our, our semester tomorrow at six o'clock. We'll host an important conversation uh, with some media scholars and experts on how to combat uh, the rise of hate and the, uh, the disinformation uh, that fuels it and that spreads it. Uh, we're fortunate to welcome Harvard President Larry Bacow and the University of Southern California President Carol Fold, who will welcome the event. And our colleague, uh, Nancy Gibbs, the director of the Shorenstein Session Center, will then uh, moderate a conversation with Marty Barron, the former executive editor of the Washington Post, Cornell Brooks here from the Kennedy School and the former uh, president and CEO of the NAACP, Dr. Joan Donovan, who's the research director at the Shore and Scene Center and a scholar of disinformation, uh, and Stephen Smith, the executive director of uh, USC's Shoah Foundation and uh, the UNESCO chair of genocide education. So it promises to be an important conversation tomorrow at six o'clock. And then our final forum, uh, the semester is on Wednesday at six o'clock, where we'll look at the first 100 days of the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, we'll welcome Aisha Rasko, who's the White House correspondent for NPR, Matt Viser, the national political reporter from the Washington Post, moderated in conversation with our uh, IOP fellow this semester, Janet Hook, who's the national political reporter for the Los Angeles Times. Both events are at six o'clock. We welcome you there, and we end with our thanks again to Professor Thaler and Todd uh, for this fascinating 
uh, conversation. Good night, everyone.